scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. He says, has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, that he does not faint and he is not weary that there is no such of his understanding. Then the Bible says he gives power to the faint and to them who have no strength, he increases might. And then he says, even the young men will fall and that the youth will faint and the young men shall utterly fall. But then he says, they that wait upon the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as the eagles. They will run not be weary they will walk and not faint we examined a few keys that will help us to survive these seasons of adversity we spoke about the revelation of the love of god that the awareness of the love of god can strengthen a man at moments and times when you do not understand what is happening around your life the love of God is ever consistent. I have loved you with an everlasting love and I have drawn you with my loving kindness. I'm just doing a quick recap. Number two, we said that we draw strength from the comfort of scripture. He says, and that from a child. The things that are written are for time, they are for our learning so that we through patience and comfort of scripture might find hope. Are we together? Number three, we looked at the power of strategic prayers. That when we pray, it can grant us strength to survive the days of adversity. And then we looked at the power of joy. That joy is a mystery in the realm of the spirit that can provide strength for the believer. And then we also looked at the impartation of strength ezekiel chapter 2 from verse 1 and 2 and the spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet and we took time to just thank god for those who are coming to the end of these seasons of their lives and then to build stamina for those who are beginning these seasons i told you that there is a dimension of pain that is a gift that it is an anchor it 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 garnishes your honor i told you that when you go to heaven today one of the ways you will know jesus is not by the crown on his head but the scar on his hand he's not the only one who has a crown on his head elders have crowns but there is only one who has a scar that what for you today may be a symbol of shame tomorrow may be your trophy that would be what would legitimize you into realms of power and grace and influence this morning i want to teach very briefly and then we'll pray on experiencing personal revival experiencing personal revival i just want to draw two keys by the privilege of god's grace I'm a student of revival. I have studied the moves of God across continents, across nations. I've had the honor and the privilege of meeting a few people who have been mightily 
and marvelously used by God to pioneer awakenings across territories. And I thank God for the bit that he's done in and through our lives within the capacity that we have served the body. And I can tell you I understand a bit about the subject of revival. I'll go straight to the point. Many people desire to see territories changed. Many people desire to see awakenings. And this, I believe, is the burden that is in the heart of the man of God to see such an awakening, the move of the spirit across territories where people come into a heightened consciousness of the things of God where there is territorial allowance for the activity of the Holy Spirit to find expression in the lives of people, in families. And the Bible lets us know that this is a possibility. Once and again, we see through scripture that there were moments in modern history and moments even in church history where there were marvelous moves of God, that God came to breathe upon a people to breathe upon individuals. But the character of true revival is that it always starts as a personal revival before it becomes territorial. No revival starts as a territorial revival. It will always start as a personal revival. When you read the book of Judges and you follow closely the story of this young man called Gideon, God desired to step in and bring an awakening over the people and to grant them the strength and the grace to defeat the Midianites. But he started, the structure of that move was that he found a young man called Gideon. And Gideon was hiding. And when he appeared to him, he said, O thou mighty man of valor. He called him by his prophetic destiny. And Gideon said, no, don't flatter me. I am the least in my father's house and even the least among my people. And now he began to give him certain requirements that we'll look at. And at the end of it, it was the man who was already revived that blew the shofar and 30,000 people came in response to the shofar that was blown by one who had been revived. And when 30,000 people came, he said, no, this is too much. And there's no time. That's not the subject I'm dealing with here. But when you study that scripture, you will see that there were three principal tests that were given to prune the people to 300. Test number one, whoever is not sure of what he's doing, if you are so conscious of home and your family, here is your chance. Go back. And half of the people went back immediately. That is a very powerful revelation that in the midst of a crowd, not everybody is that determined to know God and to get to the place of destiny. And God said, the people are still too many. Let another test come. And the last and the final test was when they got to the river. That would be a discussion for another day. There was a posture that a few people took that disqualified them. And there was a posture others took, 300 of them. And he said, these are the men that have qualified. Now we can proceed. So I'm just trying to say that territorial revivals are products of personal revival. And I'm going to look at two keys very quickly this morning, hoping we'll have a chance to pray. Number one, the first key that controls the experience of a personal revival is the power of brokenness. The power of brokenness. Two scriptures. Second Chronicles chapter 7. We'll read verse 13 and 14. Very popular scripture across the body of Christ. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people, verse 14, if my people. So this is an affair that has to do with God's people. He's not talking about the heathen. 
if my people understand the context now there are times he talks to people who are outside of the fold but this discussion has to do with his people and in case you are not sure i'm aware that they are called by my name it says but if they shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways it says then will i hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land notice it never said i will forgive their sins i will forgive their sin and i will heal their land the next scripture i'm about to give you i pray that you archive it among your most treasured scriptures if you truly desire to experience god never forget this scripture for the rest of your life isaiah 57 and verse 15 isaiah 57 hmm. for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity whose name is holy i dwell in the high and holy place that is my first location but my second location is that i also dwell with him that is of a contrite and a humble spirit why to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones look at this scripture i am high and lofty i dwell in my holy place but in case you cannot find me there there is a location that is within your reach find a person who is humble and i am there he tells you two locations where you can find him one the high and the holy place he said who shall ascend to the hill of the lord and who shall stand in his holy place and he says here that you will also find me with him who is of a contrite and a humble spirit and i am there for the singular purpose of reviving the spirit of that humble man and to revive the heart of the contrite ones brokenness attempts to describe a state of realization a state of acknowledgement of our limitations and inadequacies outside of the help of god brokenness is is an attempt to come to a state of realization a consciousness and also a state of acknowledgement of our limitations and our inadequacies outside of the help of God. That means when an individual comes to a point in your life where you are aware and you are conscious of the fact that unassisted by the grace and the mercy and the help of God, there are heights you cannot attain to. There are levels of expectations from God that you cannot meet. It's called brokenness. And the Bible lets us know in Psalm 51 and verse 17, Psalm 51 and verse 17, that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou will not despise there is a kind of man that god cannot avoid are we together that when god finds a man who is broken and contrite in heart and spirit he does not have the ability to ignore such a one this is a very powerful revelation because several people will tell you they are trying to find god Several people will give you an impression as though God is far and he seems to hide his presence. It's like he enjoys the distance. And here the Bible is saying 
that God has such, if I would use for want of word, an addiction that there is a kind of man that if God sees, he cannot ignore. One who is broken, one who is contrite, more than one who is prayerful. We're coming there. More than one who fasts, more than one who is a churchgoer, more than one who studies the Bible. There is an ingredient God seeks for in man. And believe me, no matter what other spiritual activity you are involved with and involved in, if brokenness is absence, forget about intimacy with God. It is the reason why you will find out very strangely that in the dealings of God with men, he would pick the most unlikely because by every standard they may not seem to qualify or to match up but the moment he finds brokenness it is something i learned about god very early that god cannot resist a broken and a contrite heart kneeling down does not mean you are broken crying does not mean you are broken brokenness is a consciousness is an awareness that translates into an acknowledgement brokenness starts with revelation and awareness then it translates into an acknowledgement this is the reason why i love the psalmist so much we began our discourse yesterday night with the psalm of david the psalmist was one person who mastered the presence of god because he was indeed a man who was broken and contrite when you read the entire psalm 51 psalm 51 is a psalm of mercy it is it is a capture of a man pouring his heart and his soul before his maker you take the time to read the entire text of psalm 51 and i tell you if you are not broken at the end of it you are not a christian hallelujah psalm 51 profound unashamed declaration of a man's helplessness and his inadequacy in the face of God's power, holiness, grace, and beauty. No wonder God called him. God never called Abraham a man after his heart. Never called Moses who saw him face to face a man after his heart. This was a title that God carved and gave the psalmist as a gift for the depth and the extent of his brokenness. He called him a man after his heart. Are we learning this morning? A state of realization that translates into an acknowledgement of our limitations and inadequacies. Now, we live in a world where um, our confidence is largely hinged on are various levels and degrees of competencies it is usually an embarrassing thing to discover that you are incapable in any area it's not something the human would receive normally are we together now chances are excellent that if i cannot put on this mic it would take me a lot of struggle to ask someone to assist me because the awareness of being inadequate is something that men do not easily want to admit it takes a long journey with God to come to a point where we realize that, look, there's no point wasting time. I do not know my way around this. That in, in God's dealing with men, he's aware of that tendency that men can rigmarole and gallivant around seasons of failure and would never come to a point where they simply acknowledge that, God, I am tired of this 40 years journey open my eyes and show me the way and god is loving but he's also disciplined enough to allow you until your brokenness calls him you would think that just because you are suffering god is touched with the feelings of your infirmity but he's bound himself with the rules of engagement he does not just engage erratically and emotionally if your brokenness and your hunger and your desperation do not call on him, you will be shocked that you are in a season of obvious failure and yet you will never get the attention of God. This is something about God that many believers do not understand. So they get angry and say, God, you mean you are watching me like this? This is what happened to Cain in the Bible. 
Cain would have simply asked, what did Abel do that I am not getting? Because it, it was clear that it was not com a communication gap. God was hearing him. God spoke to him and he was not even repentant. He said, am I my brother's keeper? Are you not God? Use your all-seeing eye to find where my brother went to. God. If you heard the voice of God, would you answer that way? You'll be on your knees saying, thank you, Lord, for speaking with me. But here is a stubborn man. To the point that God cursed him and he said, hold on. I know I'm cursed, but you be careful with what you are saying. If you curse me this way, everyone who sees me will now kill me. What does it profit you? And God said, you know what? Okay, what, what sort of a man is this? Another person who showed us the, the danger of pride was the woman called Vashti. There is no record of Vashti apologizing. There is no record of Vashti coming before King Ahasuerus to say, I realize my wrong. There was no brokenness. Are we blessed? A state of realization that translates into acknowledgement you see let me tell you this if we really want to experience the more of god we must learn early how to tremble before him to come before him in total openness and to not allow ourselves to suffer too long before we admit that we need his help are we together Believers would stretch their wisdom. Believers would stretch their connections. Believers would stretch their skill. They will give all kinds of excuses and continue to go around several circles. On and you see, the thing about God is he will step out and he will patiently wait where you kept him. While hoping that you will realize that he means more to you than what you have thought him to be and where you have kept him. Finally, after many years or many seasons of trying and stretching ourselves, we finally come to a point where we are forced to give up. And now we say, Lord, I think I need you. And he says, you think you are not yet there. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Here's the part I love. Hold on every hour i need thee that's the part of the song that most blesses me it's not that you need him how long and how frequent i can need you and then dump you and hope that when i have any problem i will call you back but the writer was intelligent enough to admit his frequency every hour i need thee come bless me now my savior the power of brokenness you cannot imagine how easy your christian experience would be when you remain a broken vessel before god malleable and ever open that perpetually your life spells inadequacy outside of the mercy and the help of god this is not self-condemnation this is not looking down on yourself are we together look what happened to the prophet in isaiah chapter 6 in the year king uzziah died the bible says i isaiah saw the lord and he saw him high and lifted the train of his robe filled the temple Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amidst the people of unclean lips. You would think God would say, Ah, that's too much humility. Why do you have to stretch that far? The Bible says, A life call, a seraph came with a life call and touched his lips and said, Your iniquity is taken away from you. And now he said, Who shall we send and who shall go for us? And he says, Send me. I told you, territorial revival is always a product. It is the one who is truly revived that can bring revival.
into a territory. The power of brokenness. My first charge to us, therefore, this morning is that there is no shame in realizing and acknowledging that you are incomplete outside of the assistance of God. You were designed that way. The intelligence of God was involved in the design of man. And he made sure there was a gap he left in man that only his size can fill. So no matter what you use to fill that void, eventually you will find out that anything that is not the size of God will not fit that space. The Bible says he has put eternity in the heart of man. So we try to cover the space of God with achievements. We try to cover the space of God with all kinds of things. And eventually you will find out that no matter what you try to use to replace him in your life, you will end up with the same conclusion that you need him more than you ever realized. Are we together? Now he does not become for you... Um, a God that just comes into your life because you want to prosper, because you want a job. Now, that, that, when, when it has to do with the business of brokenness, you are not looking for things. You are looking for him. He has become your life. You're not just trying to say, oh, I've discovered that my, my, your presence in my life gives me a job, gives me children. Thank God for those things and you are right. But more than that, you're my treasure my priority who can compare to you for great is the measure of your royalty oh morning star you truly are everything There are many preachers who it would take them many years to realize that no matter how competent you are, you were designed to be inadequate outside of him. There are many businessmen it would take them. You see, let me tell you, there are certain languages when you hear, they are revealers that there is no brokenness in that vessel. My thing. My business. The moment we begin to credit achievements to ourselves immediately, it reveals that there is something about brokenness that has not been administered in us. When you truly become broken, you get to a realm called Galatians 2.20 that I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. And that the life that I live in the flesh, I live only by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You no longer become ashamed to let the nations know that behind everything that you see that looks glorious, you see, and you will sing his praises with unashamedness. When people try to shut you down and say you are falling your hand, you tell them you, you don't know where I'm coming from. Ah, and I will not be silent i will always as long as i am breathing i will must be more than a special number in your life the desire to see men that through your life i i would always say it this way the more men look at you if you are truly broken they should not see you because when you look at a mirror you don't see the mirror strangely the more you look at the mirror you see the object that the mirror is reflecting so through your results and through everything that people see they come to one conclusion. You are a testament of what God can do in and through a man. 
Galatians 1 25 24 and they glorified God in me and they glorified God in me and they glorified God in me you can glorify God but your life can become a mirror that people sit and watch it like a movie and at the end of it they say God will give you glory this has to be you are we together let me tell you sincerely it's not because believers do not pray I'm not sure I may be wrong but I'm not sure there is a generation that prays like our time in the body of Christ there are people who have fasted for years the longest I've seen and witnessed in my life is 400 days non-stop six to six I wrapped up the last day with the person this happened many years ago and yet at the end of that fast you would think that person you should touch his hand and your hand should come out through his skin because of the level of spiritual emphasis because you see these activities in themselves do not carry intrinsic power their power is derived from the sincerity of the state of your heart this is what people do not understand about spiritual activities that spiritual activities in themselves do not administer any power their power is derived from the state of the practitioner of those activities that means you can engage in a correct activity and yet because of the corruption of the state of your heart it does not give life to that activity are we together yes what gives credence to the things that we do spiritually is the state of our heart and in this respect brokenness whilst you are seated in one minute i'd like you to pray and just pour your heart before the god of heaven and tell him lord i am tired of living my life as though you are not the authority over me the unashamedness to admit that i need help the unashamedness to admit that my business needs help. The unashamedness to admit that unassisted I cannot go far. I repent of it. Someone is praying. Lift your voice and pray. Perhaps there are parents struggling with children. And rather than going to God who gave the children. We resort to all kinds of things. Woe to them who go down to Egypt for help. And make God a last resort after we've explored every other thing. Someone is praying. Let it be from the depth of your heart. Brokenness. Struggling in your job. And yet you will never talk to God about it. Because you do not believe in his ability to help you. We can go to men, we can resort to systems and structures and formulas, but would never come to the God of the universe, the one who has mastered the art of helping men. There must be that genuine repentance. Lord, I have tried and tried and tried and tried. I don't want this year to be like last year struggling and trying and giving all kinds of flimsy excuses no matter what it takes i need you i don't need your contribution i need all of you i'm not asking you to come and contribute into a template that i built for myself i repent and i bring out a clean slate whatever you write on it is what i will read my heart my mind my soul belongs to you you are praying it all belongs to you belongs to you Fight that pride once.
once and for all this morning don't be ashamed it belongs to you The songs we sing, they all belong to you, and even the air I breathe, it all belongs to you, belongs to you. Hey, it belongs to you. How in the world do you think you are going to raise 500 million naira in two months? Calculating economically is a waste of time. Don't let your pride kill you. You are already in financial trouble. Come to he who can open a door that no man can shut. I know you are a businessman. I know you have certifications. But except the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord watches over a city. My Bible says the watchmen watch it but in vain. It is vain to wake up early in the morning and to sleep late in the night only to eat the bread of sorrow. But he giveth his beloved sleep amazing how long it takes the human fighting god in pride before we get to a point where we say lord help me it's as simple as that help me thou son of david he said have mercy on me it's a language that many people have not learned lord you stay back i think i can manage my family the child is only stubborn i'm used to it I, i've been a counselor for 10 years and god says i respect you i gave you a will do not wait for situations to damage you and tear you too far before you call on him the bible says the lord is nigh them not them who need him them that call upon him we're getting into the prayer ministry shortly you will be learning that the highest proof of humility is prayer prayer is not just about spirituality is the highest demonstration of humility that every time you pray you are it is it is the most vocal way of acknowledging your limitation are we learning something this morning broken for some of us after this service you need to go back keep all those pieces of papers and all those accolades and say lord help me help me the way these businesses the way this and that is happening around my life the way my family is running i need you if you i love moses if you do not go with us moses said i'm not going anywhere I have mastered the pain that comes when you are not there i'm not going to make that mistake again if you will not go with us just be sure that this is where we are camping and god said you got it my presence will go with you and with that presence i will give you rest are we learning can i tell you results do not happen to the most competent necessarily results do not happen to the most deserving necessarily there are many people who it is they they have they know how to step back and just allow the master ride through their destinies and you will find out that you will see a man with five children all well behaved ask the children how the parenting happened you will see gaps in the principle of parenting you will know that many things that should make children well behaved that man did not do it and yet the one thing he acknowledged was that i am not the head of this home i am only the steward of this home and because of that state of brokenness god said okay 
if left for your ignorance you will produce armed robbers but because you have given me my space in this home let me take responsibility can i tell you this you allow god to take responsibility and pilot your destiny and then you sit back and marvel and wonder at the destination he will take you to is someone learning this morning yes let's break that pride Some of you need to go and lock your place of business and say there, there's, there's not been sales. Um, it's not just the issue of going on Google to say principles of sales. Drop that thing. I'm not, the person talking to you is not stupid. There are times you need to just drop it and say, Lord, you are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. If you do not open a door, that door cannot be opened. And God says, you are speaking my language. Now I'm listening to you. Are we together teach everyone around you this principle do not allow your pride to stretch you too far before you come to him be ever broken before him to be ever broken means to walk in this consciousness if it does not help me I cannot be helped if it does not lift me I cannot be lifted the door that he does not open I will weary myself in front of it but if he does open that door, he can open it in a way that no man can shut. Number two, the second principle that can help us experience personal revival is the ministry of prayer. The ministry of prayer. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. Luke 18 and verse 1. There is a relationship between weariness or fainting and prayerlessness. Here's how Jesus put it. He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So that if you are not praying, you will not be able to do anything about that situation of weariness. To faint there means exhaustion. It means he's saying that it is not unusual for the human to be exhausted. But there is something that prayer can do that can remedy that constraint. Hallelujah. Psalm 65 and verse 2. Very powerful scripture. Psalm 65 and verse 2. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come unto thee the one who can hear prayers shall all flesh come what is it about prayer that makes it powerful is it the speaking is it the timing i have studied the subject of prayer very thoroughly by the grace of god i've had the honor of meeting a few people who uh, I would say have, have, have been given that grace for prayer and supplication. And I've engaged with them to find out. I have read books by men and women of prayer like E.M. Bounds, Charles G. Feeney. These are people who were purported. The body of Christ received them as gift even in the area of prayer. I studied their materials very thoroughly. In an attempt to, what is it about prayer that makes it powerful? Is it the one praying? Is it the one being prayed to? Is it the time spent in prayer? Is it the attitude? Are we together? Is it what is said in the prayer? It was an attempt to piece together the ingredients that really make prayer effectual. Because I learned from scripture that there is a condition in prayer called praying amiss. Now it's a very dangerous thing because it is praying, but it is praying amiss. And then Apostle James was teaching us using this template called Elijah that the fervent and effectual prayer of the righteous 
Is that true? That it availed much. Amplified says it is, it is dynamic in its working, it says. So I wanted to understand the whole subject of prayer because I want to live an efficient Christian life. And then I also wanted to know because you see, I found out that there, for a long time, there had been an error in the body of Christ, the make believe. That prayer is the one and only key required for the victory of the believer. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that is not true. There are people who the only emphasis as far as the growth and the development of the believer is concerned is prayer. And I have seen many believers who have prayed and I have seen the benefits of prayer in their life. And I've seen them compromise on the other principles. And I've seen the deficiency of those principles in their lives. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Not a key. Are we together? So what is it about prayer? What exactly is prayer? At what point... Do they say a man is praying? Is it when you are talking or when you are silent? Praise God. Apologies for the sound. At what point would you say that a man is praying? I hope you can still hear me. I'm sure they are working on it. So let me just have your attention. When do you know and when do you say that a man is praying? I think while they are working on it, okay, that's fine. I was going to ask us to pray so that we just allow them to do the work. But when, when do I know if I am talking, if you meet me talking, does that mean I'm praying? <laughs> is it when I mention the name Jesus that I'm praying? We're not doing an extensive study on the subject of prayer. But you see, the only way you become efficient in prayer is when you are taught. You will never truly be able to pray efficiently until you are taught. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. They were not prayerless people. They were inefficient in their prayers. They noticed that there was a way Jesus prayed and there were results that came from his prayer life. And that they also prayed, but it looked like their lives did not capture any result. And they said, teach us to pray. But for the purpose of our discussion this morning, we are looking at prayer with respect to experiencing personal revival. So, I have studied that prayer according to scripture achieves four main things in the life of the believer and i just want to bring it to our understanding and then we'll have some time to pray i believe there may be more but from my study of scripture i have found out that the prayer ministry seeks to achieve four principal things in the life of the believer are you ready number one the first assignment of prayer in the life of the believer is as a tool for transformation. Transformation. The first, and believe it or not, the highest assignment of prayer in a believer's life is for transformation. Popular scripture, Luke chapter 9, from verse 28 and 29 this is jesus now luke chapter 9 28 and 29 and it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings he took peter and john and james and went up into a mountain to pray so jesus went to pray read verse 29 with me if you can see it projected ready one to read and as he prayed the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. Believe me, prayer is able to help the believer evolve 
into higher and superior versions of yourself that the weak you the small you the timid you the flesh driven you the carnal you can evolve into a superior version of yourself if you know how to pray show me a weak believer timid show me a believer that is bankrupt of light your organs of interaction with the realm of the spirit deadened subject that person to a constructive methodical pathway of prayer and you will a champion will be waiting for you at the other end many believers are weak because they do not pray they do not pray with the understanding that prayer is meant for transformation why would jesus pray as the word transformation you know why people get saved in church respectfully speaking and after many years you look at them there's no growth there's no transformation preachers who keep laboring to teach truth and they keep shouting amen receive it and after many years you sit down with them and speak and you are almost heartbroken as a preacher because it looks like you've been wasting your time i tell you for many of them they've not subjected themselves methodically to the ministry of prayer are we together no discernment no sensitivity cannot receive spiritual things that veil after many years is still there you subject people through the ministry of prayer and leave them there and watch what happens you just watch what happens there is a transition that begins to happen to them their language begins to change not just the prayer language but their language, the construct of their understanding begins to change. Their confidence begins to increase. Let me tell you, find someone who is suffering from complex and inferiority. Among the many things you, you bring as a remedy, subject that person to seasons of prayer and watch what happens. Prayer, if and when done properly, is powerful. Are we learning? transformation when we pray we are transformed that light that is locked up within our spirits find expression it is true so if you find out that you've been stagnated at the same level spiritually you look at yourself and there is no growth january comes december comes january comes december comes prophecies come and nothing you don't feel that movement you can give yourself the discipline of prayer for a season. Prayer like eating, prayer like exercise does not happen. You don't see all the results in one day. It, the key is consistency. Consistency. You're not going to live carnally for 30 years and then pray for five minutes and expect it to cover up for all that time. You will need to be consistent. I would always encourage people, it's not a doctrine. But it's a formula I have found in my life. If you want to take your destiny serious, master the art of praying in the night. Believe me when I tell you this. You go and read your Bible and see what prayer in the night happened. At midnight, Paul and Silas, you see it. While the day was, before the day would break, Jesus would leave and go to pray. These are mysteries of the spirit. Chances are excellent that it will not be easy for you to pray effectively in the day. Your eyes alone will distract you. Are we together? Your phone is there ringing. Everyone is calling you. Children are disturbing you. You will not pray that way. Your, your entire being must be involved in prayer. If it does not touch you, it will not touch God. Some of us start praying and before you know it, a text comes in and you hold it and you're like, ah, okay, let me just quickly respond. And one hour you are there, two hours you're there, and at the end of it, you, you just remember you were praying, you say in Jesus' name, on your way out. You didn't pray. In all honesty, you didn't pray. You can't get the same results with someone who came and gave his heart and his all in prayer. Please say after me, in the name of Jesus, I obtain grace to pray. 
preachers we must trust god for grace and subject our membership to intense moments and seasons of prayer not just prayer and fasting prayer that we create a way to supervise their growth especially leaders when leaders in church don't pray they will give the man of god headache when leaders don't pray they will be carnally minded simple decisions that should be it should be unanimous if they were sensitive because they are working in the flesh there will always be carnal and mundane arguments. Don't trust people who don't pray. Don't trust what they tell you. Don't trust what you hear. They are speaking in the flesh. No matter how well-meaning. Before I trust you, let me see your prayer life. Are we learning? Number two. The second assignment of prayer in the life of the believer is as a tool for making requests i wrote here and obtaining promises there is an allowance in the prayer ministry for us to make requests and to obtain promises philippians chapter 4 from verse 6 and 7 addresses the issue of anxiety once and for all philippians 4 6 and 7 it says be careful the word there is anxious for nothing it says but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto god back to verse 6 please let your request be made known you see the bible is saying it here don't assume that god knows what you are what you are going through or what you desire he says, let your requests be made known unto God. And then he says, verse 7, that the God of peace shall, the, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall guard your heart and your minds. If we're dealing with the subject of prayer in a standard way, I will teach you something about the relationship between prayer and peace. There, are, there is the tripartite manifestation of the kingdom every time you see this tripartite manifestation the kingdom has come righteousness peace and joy the most the most um the most how do i put it now the one that is easy to detect of all of them is peace in fact it is one of the ways that god speaks psalm 85 verse 8 tells you that he speaks peace you can know that your prayer is answered not because of the appearance of the results i will hear what god the lord will speak for he will speak peace unto his people someone once asked me and said apostle how long do you pray i said that's not a very wise question it's a sincere question but it's not a wise one never in the bible is timing of prayer given as the basis for effective prayer no no when jesus spoke about watching for one hour it was just a reference there is never a doctrine you do not pray based on timing you pray based on contact and you pray based on result you pray until peace comes if it takes 10 hours stretch that far of course naturally speaking if you discipline yourself to prayer you will invest and commit time but to use an alarm clock and just pray for five hours or two hours or one hour and then stop it, you are being carnal. That's the reason why that prayer does not profit people. In true fellowship, timing is usually not an issue. Imagine that someone comes to you, he's, he's not being official, maybe a husband and a wife, and he's talking and the man is checking his watch and he says, okay, 10 minutes, may God bless you. And she says, so what were we doing? He said, fellowship. That's not fellowship. That's discussion. That's formal, whatever, office duty. That's fine. So we come to God, and there are times that God would just want his presence to rest upon you. Do you know, there are times that it would take you more than one hour saying thank you. Just thank you. And there are times that you go to pray where you will shockingly not be able to say anything, yet you are praying. There is a level of stillness that is prayer. God defines the menu for that, 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 that feast. He is the Lord of hosts. You don't just go with your preconceived idea. 
point one father thank you you are the line of the tribe of judah the the rose of um, sharon the lily of the valley now that is done father i'm here again i've told you this thing i've been in abuja this house rent six hundred thousand one million what is it that you cannot give me is it that and you are praying this is you praying now hear yourself praying I've not backslidden. I've been trusting you. Don't think I don't have options. It's just because you are God. And oh, no, 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 no. And then we wrap up with thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you because I know you hear me. And heaven is watching. Angels are watching. Demons are also watching in shock. And say, what kind of ignorant people are these? Can I tell you this? If you must pray, your heart must be involved. But let me tell you sincerely. The Bible says that prayer can be used to obtain requests. Let me encourage you. Learn to pray and to take every matter of your life to God in prayer and expect him to respond. Expect him to respond. Expect him to respond. Lord, I thank you. There's this thing happening in my office. I thank you. But you see, in making requests, God does not answer you because you asked him. He answers you because he said he would do it. So if you cannot connect what you want to what God has said, it will not be answered. God only answers prayers because what you want is connected to what he has said he would do. The protocol of God's dealings with men is that he only does what he says. If God has not said it, whether to you or that which is written, there is no basis for him doing it. I want to rise. God, I want to rise. Sincere prayer, but that prayer will not be answered. You have to find what he has said about your rising. Lord, I want to rise. And you have said this. You see, God only does what he says he does not do what you want he does what you want that is connected to what he has said please learn this very simple principle is the reason why many believers do not obtain answers to prayers they ask but you see they do not ask properly he's bound to his word that he honors his word even above his name so when you approach the parliament of heaven there must be intelligence to your prayer. Are we together? Yes. Lord, I'm tired of suffering. Move me forward. What is the basis? Why should God commit himself that far? And you find a scripture. It was the Lord that caused Moses and Aaron to advance. And that God is no respecter of persons. You see, you are constructing your request with intelligence. He said to present your cause. He said to bring forth your strong reasons. Number three. The third assignment of prayer in the life of the believer, I wrote down here, is for spiritual legislation. You can put in bracket, decrease and creation. Amazing. Hmm. Two scriptures, Numbers 14 and verse 28. Numbers 14 and verse 28. Tell them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do unto you. Second scripture, Job 22 and verse 28. Job 22 and verse 28. It says, thou shalt also decree a thing. Listen, there is a dimension of prayer that is not talking to God. It is using his authority to create possibilities. Prayer is not always talking to God. There is a dimension of prayer that is responsible for making decrees over creation and creating possibilities in your life. It is not always about asking God to do things. There are times that in prayer, you use that God-given authority to now begin to create possibilities. And whatsoever Adam called it, that was the name thereof. If 
you call it a blessed tomorrow, that becomes the name thereof. If you call it favor in spite of the storms, that is the name it will bear. Your days and your moments are waiting for, them, for you to give them an identity. Waiting for you to give them definition. If you do not give them a name, the devil will give them any name and they will become what they were instructed to become. Are we together? This is very powerful. That you wake up in the morning and you decree, this is the day that the Lord has made. I rejoice and I am glad in it. I prophesy and I declare that Gentiles come to my light. They are kings to the brightness of my rising. And you walk through that day as if creation owes you. And you begin to see all kinds of miracles and all kinds of doors open for you. And this brings that, that the joy that comes from knowing that your life is producing and commanding results will bring a consolation to your Christian experience. Listen to me. Do not be silent. Learn to create possibilities. Are we together? Every day is at the mercy of your speaking. Instruct it to become for you what the word of God says should be. The third assignment of prayer you must learn to legislate. We have, I'm sure in this church and probably following, we have members of parliament in this nation, House of Assembly, Senate. And did you know all that they do is to use words, develop and enact policies, and these policies directly affect people. Passes through first reading, second reading, and all of that, they adopt it, it becomes law. Speaking. They are paid to speak. They speak from their minds, from their thinkings, from their perspectives. If you keep quiet over your destiny, is what you do not want that will happen. I assure you, whether you plant or not, something will always grow in the farm, provided there is rain. And unfortunately, it's what you do not want that will grow. Are we together? Speak over your business. Speak over your ministry. Speak over your family. Your assignment is to keep speaking. In the name of Jesus Christ, I will not give birth for sorrow. In the name of Jesus, my mind is fruitful. The favor of the Lord is upon me. In the name of Jesus, I am escaped from these six things. Even the scourging tongues of men. You are praying and you are making decrees. You forget about what who is thinking or not thinking. Your assignment, your destiny is absolutely dependent on the power of creation. Things only happen to you if you are silent. Negative things I mean. Number four. Are you ready for this? The fourth assignment of prayer is as a tool for warfare and intercession. Warfare and intercession. Apostle, is this necessary? Hmm. Live long. That's my answer. I don't have much to tell you. Please make sure you are alive for long and you will revisit this message again and again and again. John 10.10 10. The thief cometh not. Satan is called the thief. I don't know how many of you want to be friends with thieves. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. This is his tripartite character of destruction. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. First John chapter 5 and verse 19. We're wrapping up now. First John 5, 19. Someone's destiny is changing this morning. In the name of Jesus. 1 John 5, 19. And we know that we are of God. It says, please help me read the remaining part. And the whole world. Stop. Does that include the region of your office? Does that include where your church is? Does that include your village? Does that include Nigeria? Does that include the space of the land you just bought? The whole world lieth in wickedness. 
when speaking with my people, I would always make this observation. Nigerians know how to lament emotionally and we say, who did I offend? Very comforting statement, but how erroneous. You do not have to offend anyone. Everyone is born in the middle of an old story that you are forced to be part of. The story of the issue between light and darkness is not something that started with us. Everyone was born in the middle of an old and ancient story. And can I tell you, that story is so constructed that the moment you appear in it, you must act in that scene. Nobody invites you to be part of that movie provided you are born, you pass through the womb of a woman, you must be part of it. Satan knows that everyone born of a woman is a potential tool in the hand of God. Number one, he does not even give you a chance to grow. If he can kill you, he will with joy. I guarantee you. Satan does not have to wait for you to be born again, to be trained and mentored. Uh -uh. In the Bible, children were killed. He killed them without thinking twice. And then, you now come to stand before God's people and surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. I hope you know that when you were giving your life to Christ, it was not the preacher who led you that was seeing you alone. The realm of the spirit, including the demons, principalities. And like I would tell my people, most believers do not understand the power of the life they just received. But Satan and demons understand what you received. They know the potential of this life you have received. And they know that by your declaration, you have drawn a line. I think it was on Sunday, I was talking to my people and I was helping them to see and appreciate the extent of the rebellion and the stubbornness of Satan that for millions millions of years at least as we know maybe more from the time he was casted from heaven satan is still fighting god till today what determination that he will not give up satan comes to you and talks to you about god as if he does not you can imagine as if he does not factor his defeat in the discussion satan never talks to you as if he's defeated I hope you will laugh. Let me tell you what I'm about to tell you. Someone came and met me. I think I was praying for people after service one time. And a young boy came, just stood before me. And I saw something that looked like the poster of an election. And I looked at him and he came with conviction. And I opened it. And I wanted to run away. He was coming out for president of Nigeria. Having shouted and thought that all things were possible. I looked at this, my dear brother, and I didn't know how, how, what, what angle do I become diplomatic? Do I go directly? I looked at this boy and you will know, you will see the gaps in knowledge, the decades of learning this guy would need to. <sighs> yes, president. I don't know what party. I'm not sure there was a party yet. In all fairness, in all fairness, I'm not, if I'm joking, I'll tell you I'm joking. He stood at the line for prayer. Said he came to receive it. I, I told him, I said, look, um, my, my dear brother, let me tell you this. Um, God walks in seasons, number one, and life is in levels. The gentleman did not agree. You see that? And I told him, I said, do you know what it means to be the president of any nation? And then the president of Nigeria. He was absolutely convinced. Absolutely. It would have been better if he said maybe he had a dream or prophecy. He just came and just believed that he wants to change Nigeria. He's never been class rep. He's never been um, maybe... Uh, uh, not even counselor, leader of some whatever it is. You think God hates us that much as a nation? 
I know we've sinned against God as a nation, but oh, come on, please. There's still a remnant that... This gentleman was almost making trouble. I just said, kneel down. Just laid hands on him and said, please, just, just carry your trouble and go. I'm not ready. <laughs> so imagine, do you know, with that kind of determination, there is nothing you would tell that guy. That's the kind of determination Satan has over your destiny. That as unwise as it looks, Satan still believes in his agenda. That's, what, that's the point I'm trying, to, I'm trying to pass across. You would think Satan should be so afraid because of your last testimony and not come again. Satan, you watch him. The Bible says he left Jesus for a season. You testified as a triumph of light over darkness. If I were Satan, I would give up. The way the miracle happened, he stopped the first child and you gave birth to twins and you think Satan will fold his arms. He will rest and come back again. Hello, beloved in Christ. We hope this message was a blessing to you. I would want you to do something for us. If you are new here, kindly hit on that subscribe button for us and then like this video as well share to your family and friends to bless them because we know that this message will be a blessing to their body to their soul and to their spirit we would need you to do one thing for us too tell us in the comment section where you were watching us from and if you've got any testimony for us kindly share with us thank you for watching